morning, everybody. Super glad that you're here this morning. My name's John, if you don't know me. Uh, it's National Youth Pastor Gets to Preach Day because it's the Sunday after Christmas. So if you're a guest here this morning, I apologize in advance. <laughs> you're stuck with the student pastor. Uh, make sure you come back next week uh, for better preaching because they only let me talk in front of adults like once a year. So. <laughs> it's also our second annual student takeover, um, which means really we're just taking over everything. You've seen a gaggle of students in the kitchen and outside greeting, and I don't think we've ever seen the stage that full of instruments and singers before. Uh, so it's student takeover, which means... Uh, I get to preach. And also, kids' church people, those of you that are stuck in kids' church with Aaron, well, when you get to sixth grade, this is what you get to look forward to, is big church on Sundays. But then on Wednesday nights, you get to come hang out with me, and I'm way funner than Aaron. <laughs> way funner than Aaron. All right? And so students are serving this morning, but that's not a one-time thing. We expect our students to serve on Sundays, because we don't do anything on, for student ministry on Sundays. Um, so you see students all the time on Sundays serving, uh, helping with communion, sound booth. Uh, a lot of them are in kids' church serving. Um, so I want to take a few moments here and uh, just kind of let you guys know what's going on in student ministry stuff, because uh, you guys don't get to see us very often because we're a Wednesday night thing. So uh, we're averaging like 70 to 75 kids on a weekly basis. Uh, high is being around 85, uh, and our low is like 60. It's just 60, right? Like, that's still pretty high, right? Uh, over the last year, uh, we took like 80 students to camp, um, which was fantastic. Uh, we had to get a charter bus to go to high school camp. Uh, and then we've had 16 baptisms this last year. So I'm just super grateful to be part of a church that makes kids and students our priority. Uh, and we're not like siloed in our own little areas. And also super grateful for your guys' generosity to help send students to camp uh, and kids too. Uh, we also, like I mentioned, students are serving a lot on Sundays, which I consider to be a huge win because part of our goal in student ministry as we walk alongside their faith journey and help them own their faith, is to serve. And we do that by creating a place where they feel welcomed, where they're involved, or they have opportunities to be involved, and they feel loved. As a matter of fact, this last week, me and my wife Morgan were at the mall because I had money in my pocket and gift cards burning a hole in it, right? So I got to hit up those Christmas, post-Christmas sales. And uh, a couple of students walked by us that we hadn't seen in like two years because of their current situation, living situation. And so when we walked by these students, we kind of looked behind us. And we're like, oh, hey, that was that person. Cool. Again, it's been like two years. So I'm like, maybe they recognize us, maybe they don't. They actually turned around and came back to us and started talking to us. So I think part of that is because of the, the love that we've shown them in the past, the love of Jesus that we've shown them in the past. Because a large number of our students on Wednesday nights don't get that at home. They don't come to church on Sunday mornings because their parents and their families just don't. Like I said, we have like 80, 85 kids on a Wednesday night. On a Sunday morning, we don't have anywhere near that number. A lot of them, a handful of them go to other churches. A lot of them just don't go to church at all. And so we like to create a space where they feel loved and welcome and a safe space for them to be a part of. And showing them the love of Jesus is key. And so the, the fact that they stopped and talked to us, even though they were with their friends, says something. I'm sure their friends are like, why are, those, why are they talking to those two strange adults? That's weird. We don't talk to adults. We're teenagers. Right? Teenagers don't talk to adults. 
But sometimes people can be hard to love because of whatever situation or, you know, loving others as ourselves can definitely be hard, especially because we don't see eye to eye on things, right? So how do we love one another? But not only just loving our neighbors as ourselves, but also loving other Christians can be hard too. And I would say loving other Christians is actually harder than loving our neighbors. Why, you may ask? Well, because the global church, we have lots of little disagreements about a lot of stupid things. Like taking communion, for example. Or baptisms. Or should we be sitting in pews, or should we be sitting in chairs? Chairs. Or what version of the Bible should we be reading? Or my favorite, the color of the carpet. (laughs) These are the disagreements that we have, and it's hard to love other people through that. But when the church is right, we ought to love one another as Jesus loved us. So today we're going to take a look at loving each other as Jesus loved us. And what that new command is that Jesus gives us in John chapter 13. So that's where we'll be this morning. It's page 900 in the Bibles in the seats in front of you. If you want to take one of those, take it home. Go for it. Put your name in it. Mark it up. Uh, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. So John chapter 13, verse 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and returned to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. So we start out here at the Last Supper, and we know this because Jesus knew that it was his, his time had come. This is the last time that Jesus meets with his disciples. So if you knew that it was the last time you were going to meet with somebody, what would you do? What would you say? If it's me, and if I know it's the last time I'm going to meet with somebody, especially my family, I'm going to tell them how much I love them. We're going to hang out. We're going to have a good time. We just spend our last moments and just enjoying each other's company. If it's my friends, I'd probably say, I love you. Don't be dumb. Don't be an idiot. Some of my friends are pretty dumb. I'm not going to lie. Jesus loved his disciples during his ministry. Jesus' love, though, is a different type of love because it has a response. Jesus loved them to the very end. He literally showed them the full extent of his love. As believers and followers of Jesus, we must understand that love should be a controlling ethic for us. So let's continue on, verses 2 and 3. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Issachar, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So we see some incredible contrast here. We see Judas, who is completely self-focused and self-centered, who the devil put the idea of betraying Jesus into his heart. How does someone become the person that does what the devil puts into his heart? I would suggest that person puts idols in front of Jesus, in front of God. And they're so self-focused on themselves. Judas, who was so self-focused that his love of money is the overriding factor here, negating any loyalty that he may have had towards Jesus. And then we see Jesus, who knew his identity. He knew where he came from. He knew where he was going. And Jesus appears determined to love, to glorify, 
and to obey the Father's will. And we need to remember that Jesus is not the victim in the events that follow the Last Supper, but rather a willing participant. So my question to you guys is, who are you? Are you self-focused, guided by what Satan puts in your heart? Or the one who seeks to love people and honor God? Something to think about as we continue. What does love to the end look like? Verses 4 and 5. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Jesus, the King of kings, God in human form, will get up from the table, take off his robe, wrap himself in a towel, pour some water in a basin, and began to wash feet and wipe them dry. And as Paul would write later, Jesus never considered to be equal with God as something to exploit. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. Jesus took that humble role to wash the dirty feet of those who should have been washing his feet because he came to serve. Jesus not only does the task of washing feet, but he dresses the part. He assumes the role of the servant here. You could only imagine that the disciples just sitting there, jaw dropped, silently submitting to having their feet washed. When John writes this, he is very detailed and adamant about sharing the actions of Jesus in this story. My question is why? Why all the details? Maybe it's because love is to be active. And as John writes again in 1 John 3.18, Dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. I also think that love is a deliberate action. Jesus appears to be super deliberate, very calculated in his actions building up to the feet washing, which probably means that this is not an impulsive move on his part. Remember, this is his last meeting with his disciples. So he's aiming for maximum impact on the lesson here. And if you think about it and dig a little deeper, this probably reveals something about the bigger picture of the plan of salvation. Jesus coming to earth was not an impulse of God, but part of the deliberate, well-planned plan of salvation. You guys know the plan of salvation, right? Yes, the answer is yes, you should. Okay, sorry, that's, uh, that's my youth pastor, youth group thing coming out right there. Okay, yes, the plan of salvation, you know, God sending his son to die for us on the cross and then three days later rising again so forever who believes in him would be saved. Yes, plan of salvation, yes, okay, good. We're all in agreement. Okay, cool. So looking at the larger context here, love is selfless sacrificial, and costly. So I think of meatloaf here, not the food. Okay, not the food. But instead, the singer, meatloaf, and his song, I Would Do Anything for Love. And if you know the song, as the lyrics go, he sings, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. And in the first century, the I won't do that, would be foot washing. So if you had this job as a servant, which means you failed at everything, you were pretty terrible at just everything. 
because it's the lowest of the low jobs. And if you think about the primary mode of transportation during that time period, it would be walking on some dusty roads shared with animals, doing animal things wherever animals want, whenever animals want, with a piece of leather strapped to your foot considered to be a sandal. And you're walking around and your feet are probably sweaty, right? So things are sticking to your feet. So they're just gross. The closest thing I can compare to that would be playing first base. So I played first base a lot when I played baseball. And at first base, a lot of things happen at first base. You got people running by, you got people diving back to the bag on a pickoff play. So your feet are always covered in dirt at the end of a game. Especially you take your cleat off, you dump it out, your sweaty, stinky sock is covered in dirt, you peel your sock off, and then your foot is covered in dirt, sweaty and stinky foot. Nobody's going to wash that. Shoot, I don't even want to wash my own feet. Just stick it under the water in the shower and like, get off. The extent of Jesus' love was great. But we know that the full extent of his love was revealed hours later on the cross. But not everybody got or gets the full extent of Jesus' love. As we read on in verses 6 through 8. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested. You will never wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash your feet, you won't belong to me. Gotta love Peter. He's always the guy saying everything that's on his mind. All the time. No filter. Sometimes that's me. I say stuff on my mind all the time, and I'm like, oh no, 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 bring that back. I don't want that. He's also the guy that you have to explain to like he's five. And honestly, though, he said what everybody else was thinking. Jesus is strangely and inappropriately acting the part of the lowest of low servants. And Peter is uncomfortable with Jesus and his display of love. I'm sure the other disciples are also uncomfortable. They just don't say anything. Peter is uncomfortable because Jesus is flipping the script. He's doing what the he's doing the lowly things that the only the lowly do. Higher ups don't do stuff that people beneath them are supposed to do. The CEO is not taking out the trash. He's also uncomfortable because, well, he just doesn't get it. You see, part of the problem here is that Peter is not thinking spiritually. All he is seeing is Jesus doing the job of a lowly servant. And I think sometimes we are a lot like Peter because we fail to get what we are walking through or what we have walked through because we're not speaking, we're not thinking spiritually. We only see what is going on right in front of us. Remember what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This is so true because I got three hours of sleep last night because my son got up like every 30 minutes and then he'd go to sleep for like 30 minutes and then wake up and then like lay in my bed and like, Dad, 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 I want to go back to bed. Okay, put him back to bed. And then he'd wake up and then it was nonsense. Why does that happen? Because I'm preaching this morning. That's why. 
I want you guys to pay attention here to the very end of verse 8. Unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Jesus tells Peter that he, if he does not let him wash his feet, he will not have fellowship with Jesus. If we don't accept what Jesus did for us on the cross by washing away our sins, then we cannot have a relationship with Jesus. Let's skip down to verse 12. Verses 12 through 14. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. The relationship that Jesus has with his disciples is the teacher-student relationship. And we've all experienced those type of relationships. Parent-child, boss-employee, coach-player. The dynamics of these relationships is one that is, one is under the authority of the other. And Peter got that which is why he objects so much to the feet washing. No, 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 Jesus, let me wash your feet. But the lesson that Jesus is teaching here is that if the teacher washes the student's feet, you ought to model this in how you love one another. Look, greatness does not come in the form of a title or a position or authority but instead service. Some of the greatest leaders are the ones that don't exploit their their authority, but instead that are there to serve the people that they are over. As we read on, Jesus explains his logic, verses 15 through 17. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Jesus provided an example for his disciples. The example that the disciples now have, the model by which they should operate by. They should do to one another as Jesus had done for them, and life will be better for them. This is the the example that we should all follow as Jesus' followers. The model of servanthood that Jesus showed. How does Jesus' foot washing apply to our modern day context? Well, to put it simply, we are to serve people in the family of God, especially by helping them when things get dirty. Our service is most needed in the messiness of life where people are hurting and suffering. A few thoughts to ponder on as we continue. Would the world be better off if we all followed Jesus' example? Would the world be better if, as Christians, we were less concerned about title and recognition and sought to be the greatest servant? What would your life look like if you fought for the back of the line instead of the front of the line. Next, Jesus sends Judas off to go do Judas things, which brings us to more clarity of what will happen in the coming hours. So let's skip down to verse 31. Verses 31 and 32. As soon as Jesus Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. And God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Jesus saw the cross as a time to bring glory to God and to himself. This highlights the greatness of God. In fact, this is what we as Christians are called to do. As well, in everything that we do, in our thoughts and our word and in our deeds, we should glorify God. Verse 33. 
Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. As I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you cannot come where I am going. Jesus is getting ready to depart. Remember, this is really his last meeting with his disciples. And if you are leaving and you are in your last meeting, having that last conversation, you got to make it count. And Jesus is telling them, look, you can't come where I'm going. So you have to get this. You have to understand this. You have to understand this one thing. And what's that one thing? Verse 34 and 35. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Jesus gives a new command, love one another as I have loved you. We can't miss this. As I have loved you. Before this moment, there was another command. Right? When the religious leaders asked Jesus, what are the two greatest commandments? And he says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So let me ask this question. Would the world be better off if we loved people as ourselves? Yes. The answer is yes. It would literally revolutionize the world. But for Christians, Jesus gives us a new command. Love one another as I have loved you. Biblical love is the decision to compassionately, responsibility, and righteously pursue the well-being of another person. It's not the same as liking someone. To like someone or something is to express a feeling. By contrast, loving someone may or may not have feelings connected to it. Love is the decision to seek another's best regardless of your feelings. So let's just settle on this for a moment. Jesus' love for us is better than our love for ourselves. And we can say that because every one of us has inflicted harm on ourselves because of sin. And so Jesus elevates the standard of love like his love, to be like his love. And again, this is the last thing Jesus said to his followers before his death. And he lays it out by saying, what will mark you as mine is loving one another as I have loved you. I don't want you guys to forget, though, as Christians, there are things that still matter. Biblical truth still matters. Doctrine matters. Morality matters. Unity matters. Righteousness matters. However, and this is my bottom line for you guys this morning, loving people the way Jesus loved people is how we know we belong to Jesus. Loving people the way Jesus loved is how people will know we belong to Jesus. It's not, a mu- it's not about how much Bible we know, although knowing the Bible is essential and it matters. But knowledge without love means nothing. A loveless Christian actually undermines the gospel. Why? Because as John writes in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. So how can people come to know the God who perfectly expresses love both within the Trinity and to humanity if his representatives don't demonstrate it? If we don't demonstrate love like Jesus did, then what are we doing? How can we call ourselves followers of Jesus? Are we not called to make disciples? If we are undermining the gospel by our lack of love, then we can't make disciples. In our culture today, we Christians can be depicted as people who hate 
certain people by their political party, their sexual preference, their religion, other denominations within our own Christianity. We have to change the narrative. How do we do that? How do we change the narrative? We do that by our love, by our active love, not by our words and our stupid social media posts. Because social media posts accomplishes nothing. This is how we are marked. This is how people know we belong to Jesus, by our love for one another. So how do we do that? How do we, how do, we do this? Well, for our head, memorize John 13, 34 through 35. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. When we memorize things, it starts to transform us and change us. Look, I getting loving others like the way Jesus loves is hard. It's hard because Jesus' love is a sacrificial love. It's a love that I would do anything for love, but I won't do that type of love. But once we've memorized this, it starts to change our mindset a little bit about how we can love others the way Jesus has loved us. And then for our heart, I've got two things for our heart, so I'm going to be that guy today. One, take inventory of where you aren't loving others. Are you in a position of authority? Are you serving others that are under you? Or are you exploiting your authority? Are you putting others before yourself? Are you fighting for the front of the line or the back of the line? And then ask yourself if you are glorifying God in everything that you do. Just as Jesus brought glory to God on the cross, are you bringing glory to God in your thoughts, your word, and your actions? For our hands. It's time to get messy. It's time to get dirty. Look for places to love one another as Jesus loved us. Are you ready to wash some feet? Where can you serve others? Where can you get into the messiness of other Christians? To be a person that serves people when they need it the most, when they are hurting and when they are suffering. Look for places where you can put other people first in front of you. And by doing so, we will be marked and the world, the world will know that we belong to Jesus. Will you guys join me in prayer? Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for sending your son to die for us. Lord, I pray that we show the type of love that your son has shown us when we get into the messiness of other people and we wash some feet so that the world knows that we belong to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.